Okay, welcome to lesson two on topic five, the Korean War. Um, we're going to look today at the course of the Korean War, basically how it played out, and what was the outcome, particularly what did the Korean War do for either strengthening, weakening, or changing the U.S.'s policy of containment, the one that was set out by Truman in the Truman Doctrine, that the United States would um, use military force or any means necessary to stop the spread of communism or to aid countries who were being threatened by a communist takeover. And most notably, as we learned from last lesson, Korea is number one. It was probably the first um, joint effort and actually probably the last really total global joint effort of military action of the United Nations, made possible in many ways because Russia was abstaining from the Security Council on the days that the vote had over a protest over refusing China entry into the United Nations. So that's neither here nor there. Well, it is important, but what, what, what I'm meaning to focus on in this regard is what happens in the Korean War. We see that initially, of course, it's, it's spurred on by an invasion by the North Koreans who almost take over all of the Korean Peninsula in September 1950. With the American and the United Nations backing, the United Nations are able to push back the North Korean forces very dramatically in a period of brief one month, almost to the border of China. Then, by January of 1951, other powers, the USSR supporting the North Koreans and the Chinese get involved militarily and push the Americans back across the 38th parallel, recapturing the city of Seoul, and then finally in a pushback by the United Nations forces, the original border is effectively established by July of 1953. So as I said, the first real stage of the war is the UN force advancing, okay? The Koreans have taken over uh, large portions of China, uh, or rather of Korea, and the United Forces land in Incheon in September 1950. In fact, uh, there are two, uh, it's a two-pronged attack that if you look at the previous slide again, you'll see that there are two arrows indicating the two prongs. The Americans uh, landing at Pusan and the, with the South Korean forces and a combined UN force of British, Canadian, Australian, and American troops landing at Incheon in September 1950. North Koreans are beaten very badly by this um, very experienced, fairly well-equipped UN force. Most of the soldiers who are fighting in this, of course, are veterans, combat veterans in the Second World War. It's only being five years after or so. So um, these people know how to fight. They have the best equipment in the world. And they push the North Koreans back almost to the Chinese border, way beyond the original 38th parallel. When the second phase happens, um, the United Nations really begins to press an attack. The Americans did not want to stop at the original border, that 38th parallel. And <clears throat> at this time, they start to be threatened. Um, China is an important factor in this whole story. In 1949, China undergoes or completes, if you will, a communist revolution that really in many ways begins in the 1930s. Um, China itself during the Second World War and actually from 1934 onward has a large part of it occupied by Japan. De defeating the Japanese, China is formed into two camps. That is the remaining Chinese. There is a northern-based communist insurgency led by a man named Mao Zedong and another nationalist China allied with the United States um, more dictatorial, more military bound, but nevertheless not communist, led by a man named Chiang Kai-shek. Um, after the defeat of Japan in 1945, China then dissolves into about four years of civil war between the nationalists and the communists. So unsurprisingly, if you know the history and you're probably familiar with the name Mao or have heard the name Mao Zedong, um, Mao wins this civil war and the communists take over China in 1949. Now, obviously, with a communist leader in North Korea, these, these two countries became very closely allied. And I suppose to this, to a large extent, they are still quite closely allied to this day. Um, Mao threatens the United States in support of his ally, North Korea. And he says, basically, if you guys continue um, towards the border of China, China, with its overwhelming military strength, and uh, incredibly huge population would enter the war against the United Nations force, this is mainly the United States. Uh, the leader of the United States forces is a man named General MacArthur. Now, in World War II, General MacArthur led the American forces against the Japanese in the Pacific Theater. Um, after the war between 1945 and 1950, um, he was left in charge of the reconstruction of Japan and ran Japan almost like a dictator on behalf of the United States. In fact, the mandate that was restoring Japan to both a democracy and a country that could function after it had been thoroughly destroyed, including the dropping of two atomic bombs, was given over to General MacArthur. 
You know, MacArthur himself is a little bit of a war hawk, and he is a strong anti-communist, and he decides that, um, you know, with the president's permission, cautiously at this point, that he will continue to push on. And it became uh, pretty obvious to the Chinese forces, particularly um, Mao, that the combination of Truman and MacArthur were after a big, bigger prize. They wanted not just to push the communists out of South Korea, they wanted all communism to be removed from that Korean peninsula altogether. Mao's warnings actually don't even go and stop the, the attack in the north. And in fact, by the time the Chinese do enter the war, as we'll see in a second, the Americans and the United Nations forces had captured almost all of Korea and taken over almost all of the north, including the capital of Pyongyang. In the third phase of the war, um, the Chinese come in. Um, unsurprisingly, Mao sticks up to his word. 200,000 Chinese troops join the North Koreans. These people are strongly committed to communism. They fight fanatically. Um, they hate Americans because of the Chinese propaganda is taught that the Americans are the embodiment of the capitalist evil. And they fight um, fanatically, uh, for lack of a better word. And one of the things that's often un misunderstood about the Korean War is just how brutal this war was. We think of World War II, but Korea is in many ways the forgotten war. And the uh, UN, UN and US troops who fight in Korea face enormous hardships, not the least of which the fanatical aspect of the Chinese um, soldiers, but the horrendous weather in Korea. It's actually quite cold, um, for, and, and it snows a lot. The conditions are, are, are quite difficult. It's mountainous. There's also some jungle. Um, it's, you know, it's not necessarily the best place to fight. Um, the addition of the Chinese also means that the USSR, who had supplied the communist rebels throughout their rebellion, also supplied the communist troops. So this, the communist forces um, and the Chinese and the North Koreans now are getting supplied with overwhelming military capacity by the Russians who are providing them with new big airplanes, they're providing them with tanks, they're providing them with weapons, and just about anything they need. And the UN forces, as a result, are pushed back well into South Korea. And during this time, as I mentioned, the fighting conditions were absolutely horrible. Some of the most haunting memorials, including one of the most beautiful memorials, if you ever go to Washington, D.C., is to the soldiers who fought for the Korean War. And a very similar picture here, you, the Korean War Memorial has soldiers sort of huddled in winter gear. And if it's snowing or it's particularly wintry that day, it's meant to evoke the hardships that the soldiers faced fighting in Korea. And it's an incredible thing. If you don't ever get a chance to go to Washington, D.C., take a moment after you've done watching this video and Google that memorial right now. It's, it's quite profound. Um, anyhow, the Americans um, are pushed back. They're not used to these conditions. Yada, yada, yada. Um, by March of 1941, the Korean War, which in the eyes of Truman and hopefully MacArthur should have been over almost in a heartbeat, considering the astounding success of the UN forces, is dragging on now into its, well, approaching its second year. Um, and as a result, MacArthur, who was put in charge of this uh, campaign, begins to fall out with President Truman, who um, is not necessarily happy with the progress the Americans are making against the Chinese in Korea. This is both embarrassing and probably most importantly, it is incredibly costly in terms of money and lives. Truman felt at the same time that saving South Korea was probably going to be good enough, and the UN put pressure on Truman to not go any further and end the war, because the UN at this point is also trying to say, if you continue to pressure on China, it could risk bringing the Russians into the war, and a small localized war turning into a very large one. Now, MacArthur disagrees with Truman. He wants to wipe the Koreans completely off the map, uh, the Korean communists, that is, and ignores the UN, and he begins to threaten publicly outside of the um, um, wishes of the president, China, with attack. As a result, Truman is forced to step in. It's really the end of MacArthur's career. He'll successfully um, um, fail, or he'll unsuccessfully run for president in 1952, but basically then just retires. He dies by the late 1950s. In fact, if you go to Miami, there's another, such a random fact, but I'm, I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, if you go to Miami, there's a really cool boat there that he built for his retirement, but he, he kicks the bucket before he ever gets to use it. Um, anyways, it's a, it's a nice boat. You can tour it, actually. It's open to the public. Uh, yes, uh, random fact. But anyhow, um, that's the end of MacArthur. Um, MacArthur is a really interesting character, and I can talk at length about MacArthur and his opinions. And uh, historians really are divided on the degree to which MacArthur uh, 
was responsible for the failure in Korea, but also the degree to which MacArthur um, was really an old school imperialist. Did he have visions of the United States dominating the world, much like the British did by taking over and filling the void of the end of sort of British and French colonialism, having the Americans take these countries over? Or was he just simply a military man doing the job of his, his president very, very enthusiastically? And anyway, there was a debate for the historians. What you need to know was that a containment instead of uh, take uh, imperialism is and is reiterated at this particular point as the American policy. MacArthur wasn't in favor of containment. He was in favor of completely obliterating communist threat. Containment would see that the Koreans are kept uh, divided. The North remains the Chinese North, and the South remains the Chinese. Uh, the um, so the North remains the communist North, and the South remains the capitalist South. And this, in effect, is containing the growth of communism to the extent it already had grown. Um, American uh, forces and the UN forces are now led by a man named General Omar Bradley. General Bradley is another excellent veteran of the Second World War. Bradley led the American army in, uh, in Europe during the uh, battle to liberate Europe from the Nazis. And um, he basically says that America had risks under MacArthur involving themselves in the wrong war, in the wrong place, in the wrong time, and with the wrong enemy. Truman agrees with Bradley, and effectively, the policy of containment is restored. And he accepts, and the Americans accept, that they cannot drive, nor are they willing to drive, the uh, communism out of Korea. Um, at phase five, in June 1951, peace talks begin. Um, fighting continues, but it effectively reached a stalemate. Um, peace talks begin between the North and South, um, and they last quite a long time. And during the to uh, this long process of peace talks, which actually lasts up to two years, the North and South don't stop their fighting. Casualties are extremely high, particularly sent civilian casualties along that 38th parallel. And you see a picture of many of the massacres that take place during this particular time. But by, finally, by July of 1953, an armistice is signed. Um, um, runs out of his time as president of the United States. Uh, an election is held. He's replaced, interestingly enough, by another general, General Eisenhower, who um, comes to power in the United States in 1952 on the promise to end the war. When he takes over from the outgoing president in uh, January 1953, he makes um, moves to do just that and pushes the peace talks much further. This, the sort of the peace talks are helped in many ways by the fact that Stalin, the adversary who's supporting the uh, North Koreans and the Chinese, dies in 1953. So Eisenhower comes to power and then Stalin quickly dies. This sort of worries the Chinese and the Koreans. They don't know how supportive the next leader of the Soviet Union will be. Nikita Khrushchev um, comes to power and actually it's probably wise the Chinese behave the way they do because Nikita Khrushchev um, takes a much less hardline approach, at least initially anyhow, than Stalin had. And he goes to de-Stalinize Russia, as it comes to be called. So the Koreans and the Chinese feel that without, with Stalin not around anymore, it's probably a good time to cut our losses and make a peace uh, or sign an armistice. And the armistice is signed in the 38th book parallel, where exactly the war started, was set at the border between the North and the South. So after three years of fighting, effectively, things go back to exactly the way they were. Um, it's interesting also to note that no peace treaty formally ending this war has ever been signed. Technically speaking, the states of North and South Korea are technically still at war. However, they have an armistice or an end to the fighting. So was the Korean War a success for the U.S. policy of containment? Um, the answer is both yes and no. In many ways, I guess you could say it was. Number one, the cost and the casualties are high, but they demonstrated that the USA um, had the means and the will to contain the spread of communism wherever it may spread worldwide. The United Nations is also shown to be more purposeful, much more purposeful than the League of Nations has, as it was able to use aggression or rather military force to check aggression against two major powers, both China and the Soviet Union, um, being expressed through the North Koreans. And of course, yes, because South Korea, the ultimate 
intention of this containment policy remained a capitalist country at exactly the same size as it was when the war began. So yes, technically, it was a success for the policy of containment. However, it does show that the, po the policy of containment had some limits. Um, it didn't reunify Korea, which was in many ways the ultimate objective of some people in the United States. It also showed that within the US, there is no consensus on how to defeat communism. Some sort of hardline anti-communist people like MacArthur wanted to go beyond containment, to push back communism, to eradicate it from the face of the earth, if you will. They saw Truman and the people who followed the policy of containment as weak, and this creates a division in U.S. government policy. The other side, sort of the moderates, um, and if you can even consider Truman that, but more particularly President Eisenhower, who replaces Truman, argued that sort of pushing back communism wasn't the risk, and therefore containment should remain the policy. The arguments over what should be done in Korea really demonstrate that maintaining a policy of containment is going to be pretty darn hard. And in the Cold War, pursuing containment meant that the President of the United States would have to consider the opinions of both moderates and hardliners, and this would lead to tense divisions. And actually, as we'll see in Vietnam, the sort of, um, I guess, decision between how far do we go in pushing back communism or containing it will lead the Americans to make some pretty disastrous military decisions when it comes to Vietnam uh, in the 1960s. So for the new President Eisenhower, he believed that the USA should not be drawn into a war again. Um, the lessons of Korea were, number, were this. It costs a lot and it wastes lives endlessly. There are too many people in Asia. And the United States needs to be very, very cautious if it's going to get itself involved in wars there in the future. So if containment is the policy, the Americans then shift their belief to, we will have to support countries, much like the Russians had supported the Chinese and, and the North Koreans, and try not to get involved in these conflicts too heavily ourselves. The cost in human lives in Korea was very, very great for the Americans, and they didn't want to shoulder the main burden. Uh, so therefore, they would say that if the Asians want the United States help, then the United States policy is going to be containment. It is these Asian countries that must shoulder the main burden, and the U.S. will support them with advice, and perhaps a little bit of military support, and of course, tanks, weapons, planes, whatever they need. Uh, but it would have to be the other, these countries that shoulder the burden. And this is a lesson that lasts until about 1965, where the United States embroils themselves in a war where, in Vietnam, where shouldering the main burden is probably beyond the ability of the South Vietnamese to do. And we'll come to that case study very shortly.